Today we will analyze the criminal behavior of Richard Ramirez. In this study, we will delve deeply into the factors underlying his psychological nature from childhood to adulthood to understand what motivations and psychological processes could have led to his cruel actions. Ramirez exhibited a number of characteristics that clearly indicate the presence of pathological aspects of his personality. Throughout his early childhood, he witnessed and likely experienced various forms of violence, both physical and psychological, which could have had a significant impact on his development. Furthermore, a body of research shows that such traumatic events in childhood can greatly influence the formation of pathological character traits and lead to behavioral disorders in adulthood. Additionally, an analysis of Ramirez's psychological aspects also revealed his propensity for violence, manipulation, and uncontrollable impulses. He demonstrated narcissistic personality traits, showing indifference to the suffering of others and deriving pleasure from his power over victims. In combination with his ability to manipulate others and lack of empathy, these aspects formed a complex psychological profile of the killer, evident through his brutal deeds. In this video, we will also examine the influence of the environment in which Ramirez grew up on the formation of his psychological profile. Violence, abuse, and inadequate parental care may have been key factors determining his psychological state and behavior. Thus, in this study, we aim to present a comprehensive analysis of Richard Ramirez's psychological profile, shedding light on key aspects of his personality and behavior to better understand the nature of his crimes and their impact on society. Richard Ramirez was an American serial killer and rapist responsible for the deaths of over a dozen people. He was dubbed the Night Stalker or Night Prowler because he preyed on his victims at night in their homes. He committed his crimes between 1984 and 1985, mostly in Los Angeles, California. He didn't have a specific killing method, but generally his modus operandi involved raping his victims and then brutally murdering them. Though convicted of killing 13 people, the number of his victims exceeds 25. Many were raped and beaten by him, and over time, he escalated to murder. Richard Ramirez, born Ricardo Leva Munoz. Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas, on February 29, 1960. He was the youngest son of Mercedes Munoz and Julian Ramirez, both Mexican immigrants. The couple had a turbulent and troubled marriage. His father was a rather cruel railroad worker who regularly abused his wife and children. Like many serial killers, Ramirez's childhood was marked by violence and beatings. In fact, when he was very young, he had a playground accident where he lost consciousness. He suffered a head injury while playing in the park, requiring at least 30 stitches. This trauma led to seizures, and he was diagnosed with epilepsy before puberty. Known as Richard or Ricky, he had a difficult childhood greatly iron said by his older cousin Miguel Ramirez, known as Mike. Mike often told Ramirez stories of torturing and mutilating Vietnamese women, stories he also corroborated with gruesome photographs. Mike arguably had the worst influence on Ramirez. The veteran not only proudly displayed images of himself raping, torturing, and killing people, but also taught Ramirez killing techniques he had learned in the Army. They frequently met to smoke marijuana and discuss Satanism, on the other hand, Richard grew accustomed to seeing Mike beat his wife. Perhaps it was this constant exposure to violence that made him numb. At the age of 13, Ramirez witnessed a murder. After a heated argument with his wife, his cousin Mike took a shotgun and shot her in the face. He ended up in prison, but strangely was released after claiming he had been drugged. Hanks to the influence of his cousin, Ramirez's criminal career started early when he was still a child. He used to smoke marijuana with Mike, and as is typical among drug users, they would go stealing. With this record, he soon found himself behind bars. In 1977, when he was only 17 years old, 
he was placed in a juvenile correctional facility for a series of minor crimes. Five years later, in 1982, he was arrested and brought to court for marijuana possession. However, he managed to get parole. Later, he moved to San Francisco and then to Los Angeles. By that time, he had developed a cocaine addiction and, in addition to continuing theft, he became fascinated with weapons and Satanism. In 1983, he returned to prison for car theft. He was released the following year, but due to the lifestyle he led, he was truly a corrupted individual. Years of marijuana use and unhealthy eating had taken a toll on his physical condition. Ramirez had little time left to progress from theft to violence. His first known murder occurred on June 28, 1984. After using cocaine, he left his home and got into his car. He stopped near a house located on Glassell Park Street. A 79-year-old woman named Jenny Winko lived there. The killer entered through the window and attacked the woman. He sexually assaulted her and stabbed her several times. His next murder took place on March 17, 1985. Ramirez went to the home of a 22-year-old woman named Maria Hernandez. The girl lived with her partner named Dale Okazaki. He attacked Hernandez in the garage, but when he shot at him, the girl instinctively put her hand out and the bullet ricocheted off the keys. The victim fell to the ground and pretended to be dead. Due to the killer's oversight, she managed to escape. However, his accomplice was less fortunate. Hearing the gunshot, Okazaki hid. But at some point, she peeked out of her hiding spot and the killer saw her and ended her life. By that time, the monster living inside him had fully awakened. Not satisfied with this attack, that same night he shot Tsai Lian Yu. Ten days after this attack, on March 27th, Ramirez killed the Zazaras. They were Vincent Zazara, a 64-year-old Italian immigrant and pizza shop owner, and his 44-year-old wife, Maxine. The man was shot first. Then he didn't rush with the woman. First he raped her, and then he slashed her. But he wasn't satisfied with that. Ramirez tortured her, gouging out her eyes. Years later, he contemptuously claimed that the victim was alive when he committed this crime. By that time, authorities had already begun a large-scale police operation. However, the investigation yielded no results. The problem was that the killer actually had no specific pattern of action. Sometimes he would steal from his victims, sometimes not. Sometimes he would shoot them, and sometimes he would stab them. Ramirez left a pentagram drawn in lipstick on the wall or on the victim's leg. This connected him with satanic worship. Investigators also found a connection between Ramirez and the American psychopath, leader of the destructive sect Charles Manson. The motive for the crime was never clear, which made police work difficult. In April 1985, he struck again. This time, his victims were William and Lily Doyle, an elderly couple aged 66 and 63, respectively. Ramirez broke into the house and shot the man. He then immediately went upstairs where the wife was screaming, threatened her, and assaulted her. He took her to where her dying husband was so she could see him and later forced her to give him money and valuables. He then took her back to her room where he undressed and raped her. Severely wounded, William Doyle managed to call 911, although he couldn't say anything to them. The emergency service was able to trace the call. Shortly after, the police and ambulance arrived, but by that time the killer had already fled. The man did not survive, but his wife did, who was able to give a description of the attacker. The Los Angeles community was in complete turmoil. There was a kind of collective hysteria partly fueled by what was reported in the press. On May 26th, a month after the attack on the Ministry of Justice, Ramirez entered the home of 83-year-old Malvia Keller and 80-year-old Wolf Blanche. He brutally attacked Malvia with a hammer while she slept. He did the same to Wolf, whom he not only beat but also raped. They were found a couple of days later. Only one of them survived. The next day, 
Ramirez found another victim. It was Ruth Wilson, a 41-year-old woman with a 12-year-old son. The killer smashed a window in her house to break in, handcuffed the boy and locked him in a closet. The woman, thinking it was a robbery, quickly handed over all her valuables and money to the criminal. However, after obtaining the loot, the man tied her up, stripped her naked, and raped her. Fortunately for Wilson, Ramirez left her alive. Perhaps this was the beginning of the end for the killer, as the first composite sketch of the criminal was drawn, based on the woman's description. In the following months, the number of victims increased. By then, there were about a dozen people who had been robbed physically and sexually assaulted, which, in addition to the practice of satanic rituals. But constant pressure from the media and police, reinforced by photographic descriptions from surviving victims, forced Ramirez to leave Los Angeles in August. He moved to San Francisco, where he found new victims. The end for Ramirez would come after his next attack. On August 24, 1985, he attacked William Carnes and his girlfriend. The man was seriously injured by a gunshot and then went to look for the girl. After undressing her, he raped her. Later, although he threatened her with a gun, he decided not to kill her and the young woman called 911. A neighbor who saw the killer's car found it suspicious and recorded the license plate. The next day, he passed the information to the police. Authorities found the car, but not the culprit. After analyzing the evidence, they finally managed to give the nighttime prowler a face and a name. In their database, they identified Richard Ramirez, notified the media, and the killer's photograph was published. On August 31, 1985, the criminal decided to return to Los Angeles by bus. Unaware that the police had identified him, he was caught completely off guard. Although there were many police officers at the bus station, he managed to leave, but people on the street soon recognized him. He immediately realized he had been spotted and feeling cornered, tried to steal a car but failed. He was almost lynched on the street, but the police intervened. After his arrest, Ramirez insisted he was not the killer and did everything possible to delay the legal process. Initially, he was charged with 14 murders and 31 crimes related to his killings. However, because he changed lawyers several times and because his crimes occurred in multiple locations, which posed some jurisdictional issues, some charges were dropped to expedite the process. Nearly three years after his arrest, Jury selection began on July 22, 1988. The trial took a whole year due to the large number of witnesses and evidence. On November 7, 1989, he was finally sentenced to death by 19 jurors. He was held at San Quentin State Prison in California, but the killer did not die by sentence. He died of liver failure on June 7, 2013 at the age of 53. Richard Ramirez enjoyed watching horror movies and violent pornography. Based on 56 scientific studies, it has been confirmed that the prefrontal cortex is destroyed by constant exposure to pornographic materials, rewiring the brain, and this is diagnosable. Areas of the brain, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is related to self-control and self-discipline and compulsive behavior, and the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is related to self-analysis lose volume and the medial cortex, which is associated with awareness of physical and mental state. People functioning with such brain damage mainly act impulsively without correlating causality with the actions they take. Like any potentially addictive substance, pornography triggers the release of dopamine in a part of the brain called the reward system. The main function of this system is to make you feel good when you do something healthy and beneficial, for example, eating great food or exercising well. The dopamine produced creates a sense of satisfaction, and the pleasure-hungry body makes us want to repeat these actions over and over again. So the brain is programmed to motivate us to do things that improve health and survival chances. Unfortunately, 
the naive brain often falls victim to deception, and instead of truly beneficial things, it becomes addicted to artificial pleasure inducers, like drugs and porn. And the scariest part is that due to constant dopamine overload, addicted individuals stop feeling good without its release. Some even feel anxious without vivid scenes of naked bodies. Since the habit is addictive, the dependency established is terrifying, and getting rid of porn addiction is very, very difficult. Pornography can literally shrink the brain, as shown by a 2014 study in the journal JAMA Psychiatry. Men who regularly consumed porn had a smaller brain volume and fewer connections in the striatum, an area of the brain associated with reward processing compared to those who did not watch porn. Viewing pornography, according to researchers, damages a part of the brain that processes visual images, they reported in 2012 in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. It's unclear why this occurs, but researchers speculated that the brain redirects blood flow from the visual cortex to focus on more pressing matters such as arousal. This finding makes sense as people viewing pornography are likely to focus on the sexually explicit image rather than the fine details of the background, researchers suggested. A person scanning the horizon for potential threats would have difficulty becoming aroused. On the other hand, arousal requires feeling safe and being free from the need to watch out for potential dangers, the researchers noted. Watching pornography may also lead people to value immediate pleasures more than delayed satisfaction. Compared to people who abstained from consuming their favorite food, those who were asked to abstain from porn for three weeks showed a lower level of delay discounting, meaning they were willing to wait longer for a reward. Simply refraining from porn may put people in a more long-term mindset, researchers found. Is pornography use a healthy addiction that ruins men for relationships, or is it a healthy sexual outlet that brings pleasure to both men and women? How people answer this question may affect whether they are harmed by porn. A study published in the September issue of the journal Psychology of Addictive Behavior found that it was the perception of being addicted to porn rather than the intensity of porn use itself that was linked to psychological distress. Contrary to the notion that pornography fuels misogyny, men who view porn tend to have more egalitarian views of women than men who don't use porn. While that may be the case, women in relationships with porn, consumers reported being less happy in those relationships than women paired with men who didn't watch porn, research published in 2012 in the journal Sex Roles Found. Despite scientists beginning to identify the influence of porn on the brain, they still understand much, particularly about the long-term effects of porn on viewers. We are flooded with a huge amount of very hardcore pornography. This will clearly have negative consequences in the future. Returning to Richard Ramirez, there are empirical data indicating that he had several psychological aspects directly linked to his criminal behavior from an early age. His horrifying upbringing involving physical violence and the cruel influence of his cousin's images of brutal sexual assaults and murders added fuel to the fire of deviance and psychological trauma at a young age. Serial killers typically peak in their activity between the ages of 20 and 30, with their imagined fusion of cruelty and sexuality usually starting in adolescence, sometimes in childhood, and developing throughout their lives. Many serial killers were illegitimate or adopted children subjected to cruel physical and sexual violence in childhood often had serious mental disorders within the family, substance abuse, and or legal issues. Ramirez largely fit this aspect of criminal behavior. During his incarceration, Richard Ramirez underwent a criminal examination by professionals to determine his psychological diagnosis. Due to the monstrous crimes he committed, along with the brutal history of his upbringing, the analysis of psychopathic tendencies was clearly evident. 
research on the impact of childhood abuse and neglect on aggressive adult behavior leading to serial killers has shown that adults who experienced physical, sexual, and emotional violence in childhood were three times more likely than those who did not experience violence to commit violent acts in adulthood. It can be assumed that Ramirez, understanding this psychological connection to his criminal behavior, was a psychopath with extremely impulsive, hedonistic, and sensation-seeking tendencies. Furthermore, studies have identified certain brain dysfunctions, parental loss or rejection, as well as the development of a two-phase personality and a trauma control model as potential factors in the development of a serial killer. Richard Ramirez expressed pleasure in his crimes and even taunted his victims with satanic practices and cruel sexual fantasies, indicative of a perverse psychopathic mindset. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders by the American Psychiatric Association, conduct disorder is defined as a repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major societal norms or rules are violated as appropriate to age. To diagnose a conduct disorder, at least three of the following criteria must be demonstrated for 12 months, and at least one characteristic must be present for six months. He engages in vandalism, threatens or intimidates others, often initiates fights, uses weapons that can cause serious physical harm to others, is cruel to people and animals, and often lies to gain what he needs. Based on the details of Ramirez's report and the diagnosis of conduct disorder, he exhibited several of the aforementioned symptoms of mental illness. From a psychological standpoint, such behavior indicates a narcissistic, heartless, and manipulative behavioral repertoire of a psychopathic offender. Ramirez's criminal history and early exposure to violent and criminal events in his life make the trauma control model the most suitable theory for understanding his criminal behavior. The trauma control model asserts that when predisposing factors such as biological, sociological, and psychological factors combine and early traumatic events interact with other factors throughout a person's life, it can determine his criminal psychopathy. In Ramirez's case, these factors played a role throughout his life. Ramirez's actions against society clearly indicate that prevention programs are crucial in preventing cruel crimes, mainly associated with psychological problems. A psychological construct is a concept that involves understanding a simplified consideration of factors such as intelligence, motivation, self-esteem, anxiety, or fear within a person. Simply put, a psychological construct refers to the character traits and qualities of a person that cannot be specifically identified through physical observation. Preventive programs such as improving parenting skills and creating a nurturing environment at an early age can lead to improvements in cognitive and emotional functioning, which can reduce behavioral problems. Professionals trained in behavioral therapy will be able to identify specific psychological constructs that are likely to contribute to deviant behavior and help further prevent deviant behavior. A child's ability to use acquired social skills, problem-solving skills, and other related skills to overcome difficulties at home and school can directly impact the success of individual child treatment. The psychological diagnosis confirmed psychopathic tendencies that developed in early childhood. Physical violence and significant negative behavioral influences led the individual to find pleasure in burglaries, brutal sexual assaults, and heinous murders. Ramirez was a versatile criminal who killed his victims in various ways, including beatings, stabbing, torture, mutilation, and shooting. His victimology was unpredictable and he killed based on gender, age, and ethnicity. There were many signs of significant deviant and violent behavior. However, the lack of preventive psychological constructs for engagement and prevention of Ramirez's increasing murder count prompted federal law enforcement agencies to study and apply significant efforts to enhance criminal profiling.
In conclusion, throughout our research, we have analyzed various psychological factors underlying the violence of Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker. We explored his childhood psychological traumas, personality traits, and the influence of the environment on shaping his behavior. Using a scientific approach, we attempted to understand what motivations and psychological processes could have catalyzed his cruel crimes. Studying Ramirez's psychological profile allows us to better understand the nature of his violence and emphasizes the importance of early detection and effective preventive intervention for children subjected to violence and trauma. Our scientific findings can also serve as a basis for developing more effective support and rehabilitation programs for individuals suffering from psychological disorders and traumas. However, our research highlights the complexity of the relationship between psychological factors and violence, as well as the need for a deeper and more comprehensive approach to understanding and preventing cruel crimes. Implementing scientific findings into practice will help create a safer and more caring society for all its members. Thus, even in the case of extremely abnormal behavior like Richard Ramirez's, scientific analysis can shed light on many aspects of human nature and help us strive towards creating a more harmonious world.